Hello. Today we're going to talk about HTTP status codes like 200, 503, 404, what's going on? What the heck is 401? And the thing that I really like about status codes is, well, every HTTP response has status code. They all, they're all three digits. They start with a number. And the thing that I think is kind of fun is that you can tell based on just the first digit in the status code kind of what it means. So if it starts with a two, it means success. If it starts with three, it's a redirect. If it starts with a four, it's a client error. So if we're blaming people, it's sort of like you made the request, your request is wrong, it's your fault. And if it's a five, the idea is that it's a server error. So it's like, well, the request was fine, but the response server did something wrong. There was an exception, the server is down, I don't know but it's not the client's fault, right? So for blaming people, you can tell based on like four or five kind of who to blame, even though it doesn't exactly always add up that way in practice, it's a good start. And before we start, the way I like to think about it is there are two audiences for a status code. There's human, right? Which is you get, you see a 404 in your web browser and you're like, oh man, I made a typo, oops. And then there's the program that's getting this, the, this code where for example, if you're visiting a site in your browser and it gets a 302 redirect, it won't display that to you as a human, right? Instead, what it'll do is it'll be like, oh, there's this other URL in the location header. I'm going to go there instead and it'll automatically redirect. And there's a lot of cases where programs will automatically make choices based on some HTTP status code they get. For example, if there is a 500 error, it might decide to automatically retry, especially if it's a GET request. And you can, you can configure your programs to do different things. So let's go over the different kinds. 200, pretty simple. It's a, it's a success. Everything's great. Cool. The ones that start with three are all redirects. I want to do a couple of quick examples of how those work out in practice. So I made a couple of HTTP responses that are redirects here. Um, so HTTP is a plain text protocol, so you can just kind of write down HTTP responses, which is nice. So I made this little server that's just going to serve up these responses. So this this server runs on port 8080, and it just serves literally this response no matter what the request is. And what it's doing is it's just re redirecting us to google.com. So let's go see that. I'm going to go to localhost 8080, and it redirects us to google.com. Great. We're going to do that a couple. Oops. We're going to go to localhost 8080 a couple more times, and we're just going to see we get redirected every time. Super boring. Great. This server logs every time it gets a request from, in, our, in this case, the browser. So we went to this website three times. We got three requests. Makes sense. Let's move on. The next thing I want to talk about is what happens if we do a 301. So 301 is like 302. It's the same thing. It redirects you to the URL in the location header. It's like, hey, not here, go somewhere else. But instead of it sort of being a potentially temporary move, 301's human message is 301 moved permanently. Like this is gone forever, go over here instead. And one reason 301's are important actually are kind of from an SEO perspective. Like if you set a 301 move permanently for like a, like a page you have that maybe had some like Google juice. I'm not an SEO expert. I don't really know. But my understanding is that if you set a 301, all of your sort of like Google juice will move uh, to the new site because you've like promised that this page is permanently redirected to this other page. So, but what is, what is, what does permanently redirected mean, right? Like what, what are the implications of that? So this one I made redirect us to example.com. So let's go see what happens if we go to localhost 8080 now. So redirects us to example.com. Makes sense. And let's just do that, I don't know, five more times. So if we go back here, this server is supposed to log every time it gets a request, right? But even though we visited the site five times, we only got one request. Why is that? <laughs> So what happened is that the browser, because it saw 301 move permanently, it was like, oh, well, it moved permanently, so I don't need to make a request again to this site, right, to localhost 8080, because I know that it's now just example.com. So it'll save that information, and it'll just go there forever. And this is why it's, like, pretty dangerous to set a 301 move permanently if you are not, in fact, sure that you are going to move per permanently. So you need to be pretty sure. And that's also why um, Google will sort of like trust it, right? Like it'll, it'll really be like, okay, you have really like transferred this site. Um, Cause it, you can't really, like you can't really change your mind. 
Because if a browser's cached, it's cached it. You can't go back. All right. The other three class code I want to talk about is 304 not modified. This one is a little weird. So the others are a redirection to a specific URL. And this one is actually just saying, hey, this website hasn't changed since the last time you visited it. So let's see what that means. So for this one, we're going to look at the example of js.stripe.com, which is just a JavaScript just just a, a javascript file and we're going to look at something called the etag header so the etag is basically a hash of the content of the file it, it can be any a unique identifier it's typically a hash in this case you see it's like 15 f da0 and i'm pretty sure if we take the md5 sum i know because i tried this before <laughs> um if you take the md5 sum of the javascript in this file you're going to get the same thing that's in the etag header so it's it just an identifier for what's in the file. And now what I can do is there's this header called if none match that I can send to the server um, for Stripe.js and be like, hey, I already downloaded a version of this file with MD5 sum like 15F blah, blah, blah. Is there a new version or am I up to date, right? So you're saying like, I already have this cached. Do I need to change anything? And if you do this, you see, well, you don't get any response, right? And why not? It's because you got um, a 304 not modified HTTP response, right? Which is like, hey, yeah, you're up to date. You don't need anything else. So that's a really cool caching feature. It's something that a lot of the time you can see that this uh, is served by CloudFront. And this kind of thing is often implemented by content delivery networks like CloudFront, which cache stuff for you. And they'll take care of often like calculating the e-tags and then sending these 304 responses. So you don't even necessarily have to worry about this at all. It'll just happen automatically and make your website faster in the background for you. Isn't it great? It's so great. All right. Let's move on to the four class, which are like the client errors, right? Which is like, you made a bad request, it's your fault. Uh, so, so what's going on with those? Uh, 400 bad requests. I have a couple of examples here in my notes. Oh yeah, great. So this is a little uh, request to log into wordpress.com. And you can see I have this data here, which is like username equals ASDF, password equals ASDF. This is not really, it's not a valid request. And if we make it, it says, hey, yeah, error, invalid request, the required client ID parameter is malformed. Nah. <laughs> Great. So that's what 400 is. It's like you made a request that's invalid. Uh, and in particular, the password is wrong, but its problem here isn't really that my password is wrong. It's saying like you haven't even set all, set in all the required parameters that I need to accept this. So that's 400. Let's look at 401. Yeah, so this one is again, we're gonna look at the Stripe API. And when you use basically any API, you need to provide some kind of API token. And and the way you do it with this API is you, in curl is you just do like dash U and then you put your API token here. Instead of a real API token, I've put blah. And if I do this, it's like, hey, invalid API key provided blah, <laughs> right? Like if I do blah ASDF, it'll be like, that's not a real API token, uh, makes sense. And the uh, response code it sent me is 401, which stands for unauthorized, which basically means I have no idea who you are, right? You sent me some kind of username or password. It's not valid. I don't know what you're talking about. You're not allowed. Yeah. There's another similar error code, which I, I couldn't find any examples of when I was looking around on the internet. Like I couldn't find a server that would return me this in like maybe 10 minutes of looking. And that's forbidden. And forbidden, what it's supposed to mean is I know who you are. Like you gave me some username and password, which I, or like some API token that I believe in, but you don't have access to this resource, right? Like the administrator said it's not for you. So that's the difference between 401 and 403, but they're pretty similar. They're both about like you not having access basically um, to do something because you haven't provided credentials that are allowed to do that thing. Uh, 404, we've all seen a lot. We can look at an example of this in curl really quick, but if you just go to like example.com slash ASDF, ASDF, um, that's not a real URL. There's nothing there, 404 not found, great. There's one slightly more interesting example of where you might get a 404, which is, let's say we go 
on the GitHub site to github.com slash jvns slash super secret. So super secret is a private GitHub repository I have, which is there, right? It's a real URL. But if I curl it, I get a 404 not found, right? Which is in, in some sense lying, right? Because there is a resource there and you would sort of expect to get like a, oh no, you don't have access to this resource because this is like a private repository. But GitHub doesn't want to leak the information that I have this secret private repository, right? It doesn't want to tell you like, oh, there's a secret here. You can't, just can't see it. And this is something that you see on GitHub, you see it on S3, um, where they'll return a 404 instead of a 401, even if the resource is actually there to hide the fact that there's some, like some secret thing you don't know about. So that, that, that's another common use of 404. The last one I want to talk about really quick is 429, too many requests. You see this one a lot with APIs, if you make too many requests too quickly. And this basically means you're getting rate limited. And this is, I think it's good to think of this as actually a good thing, right? If APIs don't rate limit you, that means they can't provide a good quality of service for like everyone else using the API. So the best way to respond to this, if you're getting this like 429, too many requests, just slow down, make less requests, and then you'll probably get back into the server's good books and you'll be able to make requests again. So just like wait a minute and chill. That's all there is to do there. The last two I want to talk about are 500 internal server error, our friend, and 503 service unavailable. So I managed to manufacture a 500 internal server error. I'm running a little rail server on port 3000 on my computer. So let's see what happens if I go to port 3000. Um, so it doesn't say 500 internal server error here. If we look in curl, we can see that that's what's happened. It's like, yeah, here, 500 internal server error. And what this means in this case, and what, the, what this often means is that there's a, basically a bug in my code. So here I reference this variable named hi. There's no variable named hi. There's an exception. And that's what's often happening with a 500 internal server error, that there, that there can be other reasons too. The, the other uh, 500 class error I see a lot is 503 service unavailable. And what this, this is something that Nginx will often give you if the, if you're trying to proxy, if you're using Nginx to proxy to some other service and that service is down. One, one, one way you sometimes see this is like maybe you're running a development service behind Nginx and your service hasn't started yet. And sometimes if you just wait, it'll be okay. Um, but also sometimes it means that things are just not well configured and you need to fix something and deal with it. So there's a, there's a kind of a couple of different reasons that this can happen, but it's often just like the thing isn't running. So that's it for the 500s. And there, there, there are some other reasons that 500s can happen too, but that's all we're going to talk about for now. And the, the last thing I wanted to say is there are tons of other HTTP status codes. My favorite way to learn about them is to go to the Mozilla Developer Network. So like, let's say I want to know about, I don't know, 501. I can just search for MD, MDN 501 HTTP and it's like, oh, 501 not implemented, which I don't think I've really seen a lot. Or you can say like, hey, what's 502? 502 bad gateway, which is something that I have seen. And so if, if you see a status code that you, you're not familiar with, like 206 or something, then you can look it up on, on MDN and see what it means. So that's all I have to say about status codes. Thank you for watching.